next this evening, um, coming to us um, from Stanley in the Falkland Islands, we've got Steve Brown from South Georgia Government. Steve's the Director of Operations with the Government of South Georgia and of course the South Sandwich Islands. And um, Steve is going to give us a bit of an, uh, an update um, on what's been happening on South Georgia in recent times and, um, and a little bit perhaps about the impacts of Covid as well. So Steve, if you're happy, um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for uh, in, in inviting me and to uh, present this evening. It's uh, really interesting to listen to those previous two talks and uh, mention two vessels that I'm going to obviously touch on in my talk as well, um, which is good. Um, yeah, I, I thought this evening I would um, I would actually talk a little bit about what has been going on in South Georgia. Um, and a bit of, hopefully a bit of sort of positive st stuff regarding COVID really, because um, obviously it is a bit of a doom and gloom thing that has changed everybody's lives considerably um, and, and has, you know, even touched us down here in the Falklands where we've pretty much escaped it a lot, a lot compared to uh, the rest of the world. But it, it obviously operating on a small island uh, in the middle of nowhere is difficult at the best of times and requires a fair bit of planning and to make things work. Um, but then you add in lots of complications about getting things there because of not being able to get it from countries that are struggling with the COVID, it, it makes it even harder. So, um, but I think what, what we want to sort of share really is with, it's just a little bit of what we've gone through uh, and I think we're quite proud as a team and for everyone that's sort of part of the team, so not just the government, all the people we work with closely, who to make things actually happen and we're still delivering and, and operating and we haven't just come to a grinding hope, a halt, which I think is, is we, we're sort of very proud of that, as I say. So it is a little bit operationally um, because um, that's sort of my background. So um bear with me on that but i hope you you do find it interesting and, and some insight of where we are and, and what we're we're going to do so um i'm just going to try and share my screen now and if you forgive me um there we go right one second Is that working for you, Steve? Pardon? No, it's it's it's, it's, it's um, sorry, it's operator error. Okay, let's just. That looks promising. It. Well, we're getting there slowly, slowly, slowly. Right. Okay. Um, uh, hopefully this will all work okay from Falklands. We are a bit limited on our bandwidths, but uh, everything has gone so well with, with hearing the rest of the talks this evening. So um, I thought I'd just start here at the start of winter because this is, this is really where uh, sort of everything started happening on having to make some different decisions and, and how we still operate. So we've obviously been mentioned in John's talk. This is, this is the mighty Farris. This is... Uh, alongside the new wharf, which I believe you heard about at a previous talk. So um, Barros is, is absolutely key in our operation really. Um, and you, I will mention it several times through the talk. So bear with me on that. But I just thought that's a, a nice shot of it to start with to say, again, alongside the, the new wharf where we operate out of all the time. So on a slightly warmer day and a slightly older wharf, you've already seen a picture of Pharos, so I don't need to dwell on that, but this is Pharos, which is our vessel that supports everything that the government does in the uh, maritime zone, uh, bits of cargo work, bits of packs movement, and uh, most importantly, patrolling of the, of the MZ, the marine zone, uh, maritime zone. So um, but going back to the previous photo, the winter time. So the winter time starts 
our fishing season and fishing season in South Georgia is, is our primary income. That's what pays for the Pharos. That's what allows us to do what we want to do. It generally brings in the bulk of the money for the government, which then tends to go into the ship to patrol, patrol the zone. But um, so you can imagine our concerns when with COVID, with what's going to happen with fishing, can we get fishing boats in the zone? So it really started with um, some strange procedures. Well, so the toothfish fishery starts in uh, May and we have six licensed vessels that fish every year. Um, but getting these vessels to the zone this year was an amazing effort on everyone's part. So this is everyone from the operators to the government officers, to the bass team, to the people in Stanley. Um, and as you can imagine, we had to do everything in full COVID mode. So normally the vessels would go down to South Georgia. They would be licensed and inspected from the station there by the government officer. And, and, and then if all was good, uh, they would go and carry on with their, their season. Obviously this year, it was difficult for the operators to get their vessels to South Georgia. It was difficult for them to get crew. It was difficult for them to potentially finish maintenance. Um, so there was challenges left, right and centre. So we had issues with getting observers on board. So MRAG, who supply observers, had a, a real mission to get observers on board the vessels. Um, and then how do we do biosecurity? How do we do dog checks for rodents? So all of these, these normal tasks suddenly became quite mammoth. Um, we were very lucky that we were supported massively with uh, the British Antarctic Medical Unit. So we have been constantly talking with them about COVID and how you deal with it and how we can make things work. Um, so we managed to, to get on and inspect vessels in Stanley. Uh, some of this meant that some vessels came and actually waited in the harbour for over a month until the fishing, fishing season opened. Um, just because they wanted to be clean, they wanted to be a healthy ship. Nobody wanted to go to South Georgia with uh, anything on board. And, and then the vessels were then obviously worried about us going on board because we were as much a risk to them as, as we, uh, they were to us. So again, the PPE that we were wearing was probably protecting the vessel's crew more than, than, than us because they were probably healthier because they'd been at sea. But anyway, we went through all of this. We carried out inspections here. Uh, we got the dog on board as normal. So the dog inspected vessels as they came through for rodents. So we were not, we basically made a decision that we didn't want to uh, skimp on any of our normal measures. So we carried on. This is not from this season, this photo, but uh, all lines and everything was just checked. It's just a, uh, an illustration. Um, um, it's basically resulted in we en ending up with fishing vessels in the zone. So after inspecting here in Stanley, vessels made their way down to South Georgia and uh, started fishing. Um, so this was good. We ticked all the boxes. We were happy we were operating as normal, um, despite the massive challenges that have been put in the way by COVID. Everyone was very, very pleased about this. Um, we also then decided that we still wanted to do at sea inspections. So once in South Georgia uh, and operating from Pharos, we took the government officer out and they can carry out at sea inspections while the vessels were fishing. Now, again, this was uh, interesting again, because the ships were not so keen on having someone from South Georgia uh, necessarily on board because of just the risk and the worries of COVID. So lots of reassurance and lots of PPE. Um, and uh, we, we carried out this as normal. So again, operating uh, our fishery uh, to the standards that we, we always aspire to and not cutting any corners and operators working really hard to achieve this as well. So this has gone incredibly well. So it, it basically, we managed to get five out of the six vessels licensed and um, operating with all full observer coverage and full mitigation and biosecurity measures in place. So just no compromise. So that went, that went really well. Following, following this, we then have had the krill fishery. 
Um, so the krill fishery came to us a little earlier than they normally do in the season and with a couple more vessels than they normally do, uh, partly because they finished their quota on, on the Antarctic Peninsula and partly because the ice this year was worse. So they were forced up from the South Orkneys. So we had a, a slightly longer krill fishery, but again, we went through exactly the same process with the krill boats as, uh, as, as our toothfish vessels with inspections, some here, some in South Georgia, uh, and then boardings from Pharos. So again, no, no scrimping in any of the, uh, the standards we expect. And also the good thing about them coming to us, apart from generating a little bit of income that we perhaps weren't expecting this season, uh, from extra krill vessels is that obviously they're having to pay for a license and they are being inspected and they are having to have observers on board and, and slightly improved standards. So again, hopefully that then just raises the bar of, of something that they then do all the time. So a sort of added bonus for South Georgia pushing up hopefully standards and fisheries. So this went went well, but it did mean we had two fleets operating in, at once. Uh, so we had a krill fleet and a toothfish fleet, uh, which meant two government officers were working, one was working one fleet, one was working the other fleet, and they were in isolation from each other and in, a, in isolation from the, the bass team. Uh, this is again, just being belt and braces precaution. So every time they went on board a, a vessel, they would come back to base and they would have to do 14 days before they could reintegrate with everyone else. So it's been quite a challenge for the guys on the ground to manage that, to support the vessels. It, uh, just a real team from across the board. So whether this is the planning from, from sort of our side, working with the medical unit on what we can do, but right down to the guys on the ground who've actually got to live in a small team. And there was only 13 people on station. So you start putting people in isolation, it, it is a bit, can be a bit lonely. Luckily, government officers have partners, so they isolated together. So that's not so bad, but um, there were some considerable numbers of days uh, where they were not socialising with the, the station. And of course, the disruption of closing off sections of the station to keep the isolation going. So really, this is just, this is just a sort of closing shot to that. It's a bit of a later, um, slide of the bass team this is with only from the other day from polar pride day with the remaining winter team and one government officer uh, and then obviously the just an overshot of the station and an overshot of pharos because again everyone who works on south georgia is just a bit of praise to them really for the support that they have given to the government and to the operation of the island um, and talking about isolation on on cruise as well for the Pharos crew, we've, we had uh, one crew member who we couldn't actually get home and he actually did 10 and a half months on the ship. So there is some quite crazy numbers at the moment of people going to extraordinary lengths as I'm sure there is you know, worldwide, but these are obviously the ones that have affected us and we've had to deal with. And I just wanted to share because I think it is a success story that we've operated and, and run our season, which is, what we wanted to which is keeps business going it keeps the operators uh uh happy and everyone's just worked really hard to where we are so that's the fishing season so then we moved on from the fishing season and we lose vessels so as i mentioned we had six sort of five toothfish vessels nine grill boats and some support vessels in the zone for sort of may right the way through to the end of september then we would normally have a little gap and then we would be thinking, um, oh, tourist ship vessels will be coming, yachts, expedition ships, and they can number up to anything of like 100 vessels, 100 visits, maybe around 30 different vessels in and out of the season, right the way through to the back end of March. So this gives us a sort of eyes on the ground without almost paying for it. So we have the, the fishing fleet, which will open its eyes, report anything that isn't paying a license. So you've got good coverage around the zone. Uh, then you go into two, uh, cruise ship season and you've got a similar, similar sort of vessels transiting. Suddenly we've lost all of these and we are literally down to uh, the Pharos, um, James Clark Ross will pay a visit uh, and, 
and maybe HMS Fourth will come down, and that's it, really. And at the moment, we're potentially going to have two uh, two cruise ships or sort of super yachts after Christmas, but not quite sure on that one yet. So suddenly, we've got this whole maritime zone with nothing really, um, well, not just not as much eyes on the water as as we would like. And because there is no benefit, no substitute from having a vessel floating around for, for maritime surveillance if in my eyes really under terror. So luckily we have had more assistance from uh, Mount Pleasant Airfield from the military here with the A400. So we're getting more patrol flights, which again is an excellent way for uh, reaching right out down to the South Sandwiches easily and to the edge of the 200 mile zone. We've also invested some more and some blue belt money into uh, marine management organizations, satellite surveillance. So again, trying to use some remote surveillance to target anything that perhaps is suspicious where we can task Barros. Um, and then, as I said, HMS 4th has, has just been down and, and she will go down again through the summer. So it is something that is, is we are sort of hopefully on the ball with, but it does suddenly expose quite a police zone to suddenly being quite empty of vessels. But we, we will see. So anyway, but I think the message is again, that we're trying to be proactive and, and we are hopefully uh, doing our best. So as I said, fishing season has ended. Then we were sort of going into tourism world um, and we had planned uh, for, a, for a, uh, a big opening of our new uh, visitor guide movie. For the IATO conference, the, uh, the um, in end of April, early May. Unfortunately, that was uh, cancelled because of COVID. Uh, and also at that point, we were hadn't got our narration from Sir David Attenborough because of COVID. But luckily, the filming was all done. That was all completed in January. And then we managed to get Sir David to complete the narration. And the film was launched in uh, September. So. Again, something that hopefully was a uh, went down, seemed to go down very well. And although not necessarily uh, the audience we totally aimed for, the start of a, a cruise ship season, a tourist season, I think it was something that was still very special in a time that's not so good. But what we did do before all this, and as soon as COVID, uh, I'm not going to talk through any of these pictures, don't worry, and you don't need to read anything. It was just an indication of where we are where we were, but as soon as we started learning about COVID and what was happening, we, we tried to work on how we could manage it on South Georgia. So not only with fishing and day-to-day -day operations of getting people backs and forwards with Faros, but, but how we would manage uh, tourists, cruise ships, visiting vessels. So we put a lot of work into this and, and basically come up with a plan of how we could operate and, and remain basically open. And we've never actually, closed we have had to close something so we had to make the decision mainly because we weren't going to get any vessels that the museum would not be open this season and certain things like that which just are sensible but we did and are still basically open so if you could get a vessel to south georgia uh, um, you could still do your sites mainly because most of our sites are only wildlife so there is not the impact uh, on on any population but so we did, we worked through this quite extensively to, to try and remain open and which we are still open if anyone can eventually get to us. It's just getting people on a ship and, and then being guaranteed that they're, they're going to be okay. But we will we'll see where that one goes. But um, again, I think it's just trying to be ahead of the game. I think, and this is the message we, I think we've really been quite positive and wanting to do to try and work through things to be ahead of the game where we can and, and be positive about the situation. Uh, this is just a bit of a comedy photo I put in really, because this is obviously the commissioner, uh, Nigel Phillips, uh, and my boss, Helen Hammercroft, the CEO. And this was at our, our stakeholder event in September. So as most of you are aware, we normally hold a stakeholder event once a year in London or um, to update again on, on where we are, what the government's up to. Um, 
and obviously this year not possible. So um, using the latest high technology there, you can see, and very smart desks, we uh, ran that from Stanley again like this by Zoom, which was probably one of our first sort of uh, big forums by Zoom where we were wanting to talk to stakeholders. So this went really well, and obviously everyone is really used to this now, but um, and our technology hasn't, hasn't improved. We still got that table. Um, this has led on to sort of just a bit more of what we've been up to, what's going on at the moment. It's probably the big piece of work, which has been out to stakeholder consultation, and that's now just being worked through, is, is the strategy for the next five years. Um, Helen is now working everyone's feedback. We've had some really good feedback on that, which is excellent. Um, so that will be with everybody soon and uh, uh, in the public domain. We've also um, had amazing response. We want to increase the number of government officers. We are sort of fairly stretched on, on government officers. It does get busy. It's a bit boom and bust, but we, we need to increase the number. So. Uh, We've just had our first interviews for that today after processing 456 applications. So it's um, been tremendously accept, uh, successful so far and we've had some really good applications. So that's all really exciting. And hopefully that will uh, we'll conclude at uh, the end of next week interviews. Um, what we're doing this season, again, we are still progressing where we can with what we can. So um, we are still, having our invasive weed team go down, slightly smaller than normal. Unfortunately, Sally and Ken aren't going uh, this season, but um, we do still have a team going down on the ground. The decision was made that this could be done safely and, and uh, without any issues. Uh, and to not do it would set us back. And we come again, coming to the end of our five year program. And we just don't want to lose any ground with in any of the weeds. So, um, so that's all good. They go down. They're actually in isolation here until um, until next week, and then they will go down on Pharos. So then, some of the things that have already been mentioned, we have got our our small building team, heritage team on the ground now as well. Uh, they have started work uh, on mainly well some stuff at, at KP, which is a bit more routine. But then they also some heritage stuff. We're going to do a lot of work on the well replace the cemetery fence at Gribbicken this year. We're also going to do some work on Pine Island Boardwalk, which is starting to see uh, seeing better days. Again, good for us because it's a quiet season, so we can get on and hopefully get a lot done. Uh, we're also going to do some stuff on the main store in preparation for SGHT, uh, taking a, that on as part of the museum complex. Um, and then one other thing which is really exciting, we have also got and it's in, uh, it's in with Gilks at the moment. Gilks are our turbine suppliers. So I don't know if you're aware, obviously we use the original dam that the whaling station operated from for our, generating our power. So we're pretty much 80% hydroelectric all year with really the only 20% being on uh, diesel boilers when we are just sort of a bit low of water in the winter months in the lake. Um, so, so, but we have done some studies again with Bass and um, this is engineer for KP on measuring water flows from Boar Valley, which is the other side of the uh, Gold Lake, basically the back of the whaling station. As you look at that picture, um, that's where we get our, our fresh water from for the station. But they have come back and said there's enough supply to run a small turbine there. So that is really quite exciting because that's probably going to pick up the power for uh, Gritvikan which would mean we can then maybe reduce our diesel boiler use at KP even more and go green. So that's work in progress. That's going to progress not to install this season, but um, it's just it's just quite exciting on the, on the greening the station a little bit more. Um, the, the other two projects, we've obviously, Rob's mentioned a lot about the viola, which uh, we're involved with as well and, and trying to advise. We've got a, a marine engineer going down who's going to undertake a, a virtual survey. Um, and he goes in after Christmas. So that's quite exciting to see where, where that's going to go. Uh, and then below that uh, was the announcement last week from SGHT of the, the new artistic commission, which is uh, going to run over the next couple of years for the Flensing Plan. Um, again, just something quite exciting that's, that's sort of coming up. 
And again, I just had to put them in because, I don't know, stamps seem to be quite a big thing in South Georgia office. Everyone gets a feed into it. And uh, it was a big year because it was farewell to Clyde, who had been down uh, for 10 years in the Falklands as the patrol vessel, been down a lot to South Georgia, and, and very much becomes part of every team's life, same as the Pharos does down there. Um, and they, they switched out and HMS 4th has taken over. So uh, I just wanted to include that. It was a nice one that was, uh, uh, was just convenient at the right time. So then moving on, we have also started looking at the A68. So this is something that everyone has heard of in the, in the news. Again, quite exciting. Um, again, working, we're going to be working more with Bass. Bass are planning to deploy some gliders and I'm sort of hoping that Faros might be doing some recovery of them just because it's, it's brilliant to get Faros involved in some of the science as well. But we went down to have a look at uh, the A68 on a routine patrol a couple of weeks ago. The weather was absolutely awful. Um, and we didn't get uh, any good pictures, unfortunately, but we did get quite an interesting radar shot. That is obviously the edge of the A68 um, disappearing off the screen. Um, it, it did get some uh, sextant readings for actual heights on it when the fog cleared, uh, uh, which was about 30 meters. And since then, we've had a, an overflight from the A400 whilst patrolling the, the zone as well. And I'm hoping to get some photos of that tomorrow, which we're looking forward to uh, obviously sharing with people who know much more about uh, glaciers than, than we do, which obviously Bass. So, uh, but it's, it's becoming part of our monitoring now. It was quite interesting though, because Faros uh, steamed through about eight hours of brash ice and gradually getting bigger, burger, bigger icebergs to get, to get to the ice edge and then were, I think quite relieved to get out of that before it got dark. But, um, and lastly, just uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, a bit maybe a bit all over the place, but hopefully not too bad. I think just wanting to show that we are we are doing quite a lot, and hopefully it's it's all good, and, and trying to do as much as we can. But um, I mentioned the rodent detector dog. Now this is something that has really been successful and is totally key in our operations here in the Falklands for vessels. So again, this is Sammy's nose. He's our, our sniffer dog who's based here in the Falklands. Uh, and he um, would normally start to being quite busy now with all of the uh, cruise ships coming through, but he's off just keeping up to speed with his training with Faros's visits every time. Um, but he is uh, going to be, there's a, a talk on him next Wednesday, which you can get the invite from our Twitter page or our Facebook page. And it's just a little bit about the program. What's really good about this is that um, the same company that presided the consultancy and the expertise and the knowledge to our team here on the ground are now also working with a dog team in the, in the UK, which are working with Bass to check the, the Bass vessel as well. So, so a, a companion of Sammy uh, thoroughly inspected JCR before she departed um, to head to KB. And again, that's brilliant for us because biosecurity is something we've not really flexed on with COVID and don't really want to because it's it's key to looking after South Georgia. But um, JCR is sailing all the way from the UK straight to King Edward Point. So it's, a, it's, again, really good to have the ship checked before she sails. And uh, then you know you've got no issues when she comes alongside at... Uh, at KEP. So um, do look out for that. Everyone does seem to like the dog. Um, but uh, and that's that's it for me, really. So I'd just like to say thank you very much. I hope that's been sort of interesting, a little bit different, but um, sort of a bit of an operational look at what's going on at the moment. And, and hopefully we'll uh, continue to just improve and uh, things will come back to a bit more normality soon. But uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Steve. That was, um, yeah, really, um, really good insight into what's been happening in a, an interesting and eventful time down there. Um, so I'm just having a look through the chat in case there are any any questions for you. If if people have got questions, um, please feel free to to throw them in. Um, I'm sure Steve will be happy to answer. Um, I don't see anything coming through for you, Steve. 
Oh, that's all right. Well, hopefully I've answered everyone's questions. Well, maybe so. What's the, what's the timetable for the strategy, Steve, and, and the sort of um, getting that um, finalised and implemented? Um, it is still be having the comments incorporated at the moment, and uh, then it's got to go to the FCDO, and then it will progress from there. So um, I don't actually know the final timeline. That's um, Helen's baby, really. So, but it's 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 imminent. As she's yeah, we've got we've incorporated everybody's uh, feedback, so uh, which is good, and we've had some very good feedback, which is great. Oh, so the the boss is here now. No. <laughs> I've managed to find a few minutes. I've got to disappear in about 15, but if um, if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to try and take them. Um, well, great to see you, Nigel. And um, I'm, uh, there may well be one or two questions. We've had some um, fantastic talks from John Dickens on, on the drones and the surveys at, at South Georgia that he did last year. Rob's given an excellent talk about the, um, the viola, and Steve's given us a fantastic update on, on South Georgia government. So. Um, um, it's all gone down very well, but I'm I'm happy to. I'm just looking at the chat actually on this on the Zoom to see if um, if anyone's popping up. Um, and what a question actually just for Steve and from from Pat about about the um, solar heating that used to be at KEP. And are there any plans to um, to win? <laughs> yeah, actually that that has um that has actually raised its. Uh, it's had just recently. We are actually going to have a uh, a pyrology survey um, as part of just seeing. We need to know the levels of sunlight basically again. So, and I think this would be uh, more looking at the PV side of solar panels rather than sort of the evacuated tubes which were there before, which had issues with um, the ice and then getting way too hot in the summer. So, again, it's part of the, the strategy, like I mentioned, the hopefully. The extra hydro for KEP for for Gritvikan side, this this is another 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 avenue to explore just with the technology of PV stuff um, becoming so much better, and uh, and again that fits in working that's that's working with Bass to uh, to fund that survey um, and their in sort of renewables department. So um, again, yeah, I definitely think so. Anything anything we can do to reduce uh, uh, that tiny bit of of, of diesel we still use for heating, the better. It's so much nicer at KP not having generators running at all. So uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. So definitely, definitely on the cards. Right, well, there's a couple of questions. I, I will invite the, the questioners to, to, to talk to you directly. So the first question is from David Drury. David, are you, are you there? Yes, I am. And it's delightful to see you, Nigel. Um, and uh, I hope everything is going well. We've heard a great story from, from Steve about uh, what the government's doing. Just a quick one. The Chancellor announced yesterday um, in uh, his uh, announcement on financing a cut in the FCDO budget. And I wondered whether any of that might actually affect the government of South Georgia. It's So the spending review is still very, very... Uh, wet paint in terms of the granularity of what it is, but the major part of the reduction to the FCDO is in fact, as you'll be aware, in terms of the government's decision that it won't achieve 0.7% of GDP for aid, and as SGSSI is not overseas development aid ODA eligible, it won't directly affect us. So strictly speaking, in terms of the way we operate, as you know, South Georgia is self-financing, but we do benefit from a number of funds in terms of science projects, Blue Belt, CSSF, et al. I think at the moment that's looking reasonably solid. As I say, it's still wet paint and we need the extra granularity. But at the moment, given where we are and given our self-financing status and given how this year has gone, I don't, <laughs> it was dangerous saying this. At the moment, we don't see danger on the horizon in terms of the budget. Um, thanks very much, Nigel. Um, next question, I'll go across to Alison Neal. Alison, are you, are you there? Yes, 
Um, hello there, everyone. Um, so my questions to both uh, Nigel and Steve, I don't know who would prefer to respond. Um, what role, if any, do you see drones playing in government's management in the future? Hi, Alison. Um, yeah, um, we're definitely seeing them coming in more and more. Certainly John's work that he has done has just sort of reinforced that certainly with our routine monitoring sites, say of, uh, in the Bay of Isles, so Prion Island, Albatross Island, and the other islands, which we don't normally normally count. So I think we're keen on anything that can be uh, used, droned basically to be less intrusive, certainly on the wildlife front. Um, and you can get more data, more accurate data. So that is definitely good. It certainly, it did actually, the drone off Pharos, we do have a drone on Pharos, which um, we used last year with a, a suspect vessel in the zone while the sea was too rough uh, to board. And we actually flew around it and got some amazing footage of the vessel at the time showing, showing, showing things, showing fishing gear. And once you start looking harder at the picture and then the follow up after our government officer boarded the vessel, you, it definitely tells a the tale of what was going on. So I can see definite use for, for patrolling if you encounter something and you can't get necessarily in the water or onto the ship. Uh, definitely the, the wildlife and certainly again, John showed the, the, the whaling station images. That's something we are keen. And I've, I've again, we're very keen to see those um, because we want to monitor the, the whaling stations and just flying a drone at the start of winter, end of winter is a really good tool just to keep a check on what's going on where with, with the stations really. So I, I think used properly uh, and with a, a directed sort of task, otherwise you just end up with masses and masses of images and footage that is lovely, but it might not, it, it fills up servers. So, but yeah, I can see them being really useful as we, as we move on. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Thank you, Steve. Um, next question I have is from Jane Francis. Jane, are you, are you there? Yeah, Jane, Jane, how are you? <laughs> yeah, a qu quick question. Um, I know it's not peak tourist season yet, but I just wondered if you'd sort of anecdotally noticed any difference with the lack of tourists at the end of last season and the beginning of this season. Are the wildlife celebrating? <laughs> we haven't had any parties yet. Um, <laughs> it is a little early to tell, really, Jane. I mean, it is. It will be useful, obviously, with your teams moving around and um, what they observe. And I think we we will be asking them because part of the work that we've been doing in identifying which sites we can use to, you know, evolve our management to try and ensure that visitation is balanced and that the you know, the distribution and impacts are managed is something that we've been working on. So I think this season, you know, like everything, you try to take the silver linings. This season, once we get to the end of it, will be a useful benchmark. And we will be asking teams as well as the government officers to try and form an assessment. So too early yet, uh, but it's, it's something we're definitely going to look at. Great. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you, Jane. Um, Gordon Little has a question. Gordon, are you are you there still? Uh, yeah. Hi, Steve. In particular, um, when we installed the hydro scheme originally, the intention was that it would reduce diesel costs in order to pay back in about eighteen years. Has anybody monitored that, and do we know if it's being as successful as it was intended back then? I, I read your question, and I was like. I don't know the answer, but I am actually quite intrigued now, and I, I'd quite like to do that, especially as we're potentially going to get a quote eventually for a, a smaller plant, maybe. So I think it's something we definitely need to look at. Um, all I can say is that it is amazing. It is absolutely amazing. It took a little while to settle down, but but the plant now that we have is it's phenomenally rural, phenomenally. I can't say the word. Uh, incredibly reliable and, um, and 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 you just cannot wish for a, a sort of I don't know I think it's an ideal green technology that, that we're so lucky to have and so lucky that the Norwegians uh, thought of it and 
and installed the dam in 1906, nine, top of my head. Uh, I have to say, we've just had the Joint Ministerial Council today with all the OTs represented. And Zach Goldsmith, who's the Minister for the Environment and the Oceans, you know, made a really powerful intervention about the need to try and find getting ourselves to net zero. And the, the foresight that led to that hydro capacity putting, being put in was absolutely superb and has helped us so much as we move forward. So, you know, I would only say thank you to those who went before. And I'd say that about so many things, actually. I've been writing the forward to the strategy and so much you realize we're building on the shoulders of giants. You know, it's not just this team, it's the teams over the years that have taken us forward. And that's just one more example of the forward thinking that's gone into South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands that we seek to, to be good stakeholders of and to, sorry, good, um, what's the word? Uh, Oh, custodian, or, um, yeah, it's a balanced uh, coin. Stewards, stewards, to be good stewards of of South Georgia, and I think it's a really good way of looking at it. It's building on the legacy that's been bequeathed to us by, in many cases, you, um, but all the others who've worked in the teams, not just in the government of South Georgia, but in the various entities, SGHT, and all the wonderful work that was done on and road to eradication. I could go on. I won't bore you. Thank you very much, Nigel, and thanks, Gordon, for the question. And um, yes, uh, next, there's a couple of questions actually about A68. Um, first one is from Alan. Alan, would you like to ask the question yourself? Hi. Yeah. Yes, if you can hear me. In what ways do you monitor the route of the A68? And where at present is the best guess to where it will end up? And if I can ask VB's question, because it's obviously linked, how is this affecting your work and your plans and your projects? Yes, very good. Okay, so um, we're I, think, we're I, I was going to say, <laughs> I said, we, we have been, um, yeah. enough again, assisted by Bass in predicting its movement and monitoring its movement. Bass will put together some really good little uh, footage from the Sentinel uh, satellites of its progress as it's moved up. Uh, from the Antarctic and twisted around. Um, and here we go. Very good, Martin. And uh, so this is, I think, the primary way it has been monitored um, so far. And certainly people, scientists in Bass, or much more than us, I'm, I'm afraid I'm an engineering background and not a scientist. Um, so, and now it's in our zone, we're obviously a little bit more interested in it. There's all the predictions about where it might go. It's, we know it's 200 meters, uh, sort of draft of 200 meters uh, from Faris's little visit. I think it's about 30 meters above sea level uh, to the top of it. It has got some cracks on it. It will ground somewhere around South Georgia. I, I can't really answer where, where, it will, where it will definitely go. My gut feeling from previous things would be it will go around the south of the island and probably break up. But again, that's an engineer's... Uh, guess and um, not anything massively scientific. Um, we will keep an eye on it, obviously, because in the past there has been, has affected uh, um, toothfish grounds where things have gro um, grounded. It also, again, operationally, if it breaks up and gives us big bergs hanging around South Georgia, big bergs are really good to hide ships behind. So again, that's so that's my operational head thinking that we'll be taking a lot more interest if we end up with lots of big bergs in case there's someone behind one who shouldn't be behind one. Um, so again, we'll, we're going to be lucky enough to have obviously the Sentinel uh, um, satellite. We'll keep monitoring it. We'll get experience and advice and science from Bass. As I mentioned, they were going to deploy some gliders and do some, some more work on it. And, and we'll have the MOD, the A400, we'll be able to get overflight and some aerial photographs of it as well. So we will obviously just keep an eye on it and, and see where it goes and, and take it from there. There's probably a lot more science that could be said, we need to do this and we need to do that, but I can't answer that, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you want to add anything to that, Jane Francis, if you're, yes, you're still there. 
Um, no, it's a very good answer, Steve. I've, I've we've just seen the latest picture. I think um, Jane, Jane Rummel could say, what was it on Twitter or Instagram today? And um, the iceberg is still coming toward, uh, towards the shelf. I think it's about, my estimate was it was about 150 kilometers from the edge of the Southwestern shelf. Uh, and it's just swinging backwards and forwards in the in the small gyres in the in the current, but it's still tracking towards South Georgia, and it doesn't look like it's well. It certainly hasn't broken up yet. So um, we're still. I mean, Ambassador just saying we still don't know exactly where it's going to go because it could go off to the north or it could go off to the south. We'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, but it's still on track. Thanks very much, Jane, and. Um... There's one more question from an interesting question from Bruce Mayer on the on the chat. I think for you, Steve. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, I can see. I just does um, just Bruce want to read it out, or do you want me to read it out, Bruce? Okay, I I can read it out. So Bruce has asked: Is there a conflict? I think this is the one. Uh, is there a conflict of interest between krill and fishing and the future conservation of wildlife on South Georgia and the surrounding seas? Um, again, maybe a little bit scientific for me, but I can, I can honestly tell you what I know about our krill season this year um, is that we have only, only fished 43% of the total available catch. And... Um, and again, as the mit mitigation and conservation measures I, I sort of mentioned earlier about what we have put in place for the, the fleet. Um, and then all the work that CFAS does, BAS does on the, on the zone where we can fish so that we don't affect um, uh, the, the wildlife on shore, the penguins where they, where they feed. I, I would say again, this is layman's terms, but I, th I think that's, this is what I believe, that, that we are managing it so that it's okay, that it is sustainable and it is getting better and better and, and how we have a, a really good fishery for, for krill and, uh, you know, working up to the, the, the absolute gold standard of our toothfish fishery. I don't know, sorry, Nigel? Was... Yeah, I'd just add a little more to that. I'm not sure how much... Steve had said earlier about the fact that as a consequence of the five year review, we increased the standoff distances from the island. And that was based on precautionary science advice. And I think so far as we can tell that that is the, the most precautionary approach. Now, it's always you need more science and there are plans. And had we had Mark Belcher here, who talked to you more about the plans that we have to conduct more evidence gathering in the next year to help inform that picture. We're also working with Jane Rumble in FCDO, who's also our Camelot Commissioner, of course, to ensure that we can get the most informed picture to advance the approach. You will see in the strategy that one of the things that we are absolutely staying true to is the need to ensure that wildlife comes first. And that what we're undertaking is something that's consistent with a precautionary, sustainable approach. We won't move away from that. So if the science tells us to go in a different direction and become even more precautionary, we will. Period. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Nigel. That was really, really helpful. Um, I was going to offer to chip in, but I, I think you've done a very good job of covering that. <laughs> um, we have a... Um, a couple more questions, if you have the time. Um, one is from, uh, I can't quite read that without getting too close, about blue whales and the recovery of blue whales. Um, are they mostly on the shelf edge? Um, maybe actually I can perhaps answer that question there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go for it. Um, I, 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 was, I was involved in the survey that's just been published, actually, of whales around South Georgia, where we saw large numbers of blue whales in um, in January of this year. It seems a long time ago now. And um, we were actually surprised by seeing, and as you saw from John Dickens's footage as well, seeing blue whales quite close in shore, both on the south side of the island and to the north. Although I think the general thoughts are that they are more likely to be found in the shelf edge. Um, and the survey we did, which was on a boat called the Braveheart, we were actually more focused on southern right whales, so we're working more inshore. 
So it didn't really get out to the shelf edge that much. So we, but we did see a lot of blue whales out there. So um, I hope that helps ask your question. There is a paper just published in Endangered Species Research, um, which deals with the recovery of blue whales. So I will point you in that direction. Um, there's now a question from Peter Gilbert. Peter, do you want to ask this one yourself? I'm very happy if you'd like me to. Uh, Nigel, it's Peter Gilbert from RCDS. How, how are you? Yes. Hello, <laughs> Peter. Hi, good, good to see you. So I, as I've said there, it's a very selfish question. I'm due to be visiting, uh, uh, visiting <laughs> you in February 2022. Any gut feelings about how, how close to normal things might be by then? I know it's an impossible question, really. <laughs> Well, I think February 2022 is probably going to have better chance of success than February 2021. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, I'll be really candid about where we are at the moment. The tourist, the cruise ship industry has effectively cancelled the Austral summer season. There are a couple of boats that are seeking to conduct operations. And one of the things I thought may happen, we have seen an example of, which is a vessel that's going to go to sea for a month. So as long as you've got clean crew and clean packs, then you should be safe as long as you maintain a hermetically sealed program. And that's exactly what their plan is. And they're going to take in Antarctica, South Georgia, and then disembark from the Falkland Islands. So that's the plan. Uh, there's an awful lot of protection measures that needed to be put around that. What the season being cancelled is going to do on top of the cancellation of the northern season is really hard to tell. Um, you know, a lot of these vessels are expensive things to just keep going. And there are, you know, there are, you've probably read in the news as I have, there are vessels cruising up and down the Mediterranean just to keep their machinery working over and coming to Gibraltar to refuel. That said, all the operators are still talking to us about developing the programs. So I would say if one considers, you know, and this is all speculative, but if one considers the advances that are coming in rapid testing, the advances that are coming in vaccines, albeit they need to be proven, it doesn't sound unreasonable that there will be a season what that will look like exactly and whether or not all the operators that were there last season will still be there this season, don't know. But I think it's a reasonable chance given the advances that have been made. The position of the government of South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands is, as long as you can come safely, you are welcome. And we've, we've made that declaration at the outset to, to try and help as best we can. Uh, and we've worked with a couple of the operators to see if things were possible. One of the final points I'll make, of course, is the position of the Falkland Islands, because for a number of people, the Falkland Islands is an also really important part of their journey. Yeah. Um, the Falkland Islands, understandably, are being very precautionary when it comes to visitation. Um, and so we're going to need to see how that evolves. And there are a number of programs in place to try and keep the tourist industry in being within the islands so that if when cruise ships come back, there's something to visit. And that's you know part of part of the challenge, but there's some really good work being done there. Our guess at the moment is there will be an Austral summer 21-22. We think there will be, but we don't know the scale. Thanks very much. That's fantastic. Uh, that's sort of where I was imagining things were, but thanks very, very much for that, Nigel. Well, I hope to see you when you come through. Fingers crossed. You might see me before because I'm penned in for a, a Mount Pleasant tour in, uh, in July next year as well, actually. <laughs> oh, lucky you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> well, that's, that's great. Really, Thank you. I've got about two minutes, so I'm going to have to run. Are there any final questions for me, which I'm happy to try and answer, but um, I do have to run in about five. I've pushed it. Um, are there any final questions for me? Otherwise, I'll leave you in the capable hands of Steve. I think that's wrapped up all the questions, actually. Thank you, Nigel, and, and Steve as well. Um, I think we're drawing to a close now anyway, and I think people are, ordinarily we'd move on to the bar and have a beer and a chat, but um, sadly that's not quite possible. Uh, but anyway, um, thank you very much for your time and, and um, answering those questions, and thanks also to Rob and to, to John for excellent talks, and thank okay. you all for joining this evening. Um, and as David said earlier, for those of you who aren't um, already members of the South Georgia Association, please, um, Think about joining. So thanks everyone for your time this evening. Thanks to the speakers and I hope you've enjoyed it and 
look forward to hosting another round for you sometime in the future. Thank you very much. Really good. Thank you. Lovely to see you all. Bye-bye.